are you getting serious cricket vibes from your content marketing? It might have nothing to do with the quality of the content that you're producing, but more have to do with what you're not doing before you write a word, the research. Today, I have Josh Garofalo, the CEO of Sway Copy, and he teaches us his three-part system for doing research before he writes one word. It's simple to follow and makes so much sense. By following this formula, you will be able to create content that you know, you're not guessing, you know will resonate with your audience. That interview is coming up right now, but if you prefer video, fear not. I've got video for you too. Just head on over to our show notes page and you'll find our video interview right there. Hello and welcome to Tiny Marketing. I'm Sarah Noel Block and I teach small marketing departments that are tired of feeling overwhelmed and under-resourced how to build and manage effective and efficient marketing strategies that work for them. Get ready, it's time to dig in and get a big impact with your tiny team. Good copywriting is like a superpower. It can build trust, it can strengthen relationships, and it can sell for you. Today, I have Josh Garofalo from Sway Copy, who will teach us about the strategy behind amazing copywriting that actually converts. Learn how to research, strategize, and plan for copywriting that generates real revenue. So many people make the mistake of thinking that they can do their own copywriting. But by hiring a copywriter trained to convert prospects to leads and leads to sales, you'll get your money's worth 10x, I swear. Join me in welcoming Josh to the show. Hey, Josh, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, so my name is Josh Garofalo, or some people say Garofalo. I'll take both. Um, in the intro, I've been with... I did the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Janine Garofalo, she kind of hijacked the name. So that's why um, I did it that way. (laughs) That's where it comes from. Yeah, exactly. So Garofalo is totally fine. I own swaycopy.com. Recently, I've started another little project called categorystory.com, which we might get to uh, during our recording here. Basically, I'm a SaaS consultant and copywriter. I've worked with clients like HubSpot, Unbounce, Wave, Hotjar, bunch of other companies that you would have heard of and even more that you've never heard of, but you probably will in the next you know, two to three years once they, once they get growing. And yeah, I guess recently I've turned my attention, I wouldn't say away from copywriting. It's definitely still the bulk of what I do, but moving sort of upstream a little bit more and looking at positioning, messaging strategy, how to compete against similar competitors and things like that. Yes. And that's what we'll be talking about today, which I'm super excited about because that's the part where like the real strategy comes in. And without that, you wouldn't be able to convert the way you do. But before we started recording, you were telling me about a contest you won and how you got into copywriting. Can you just tell that story to the to the people here? <laughs> For sure. So if you are in copywriting at all, you've probably heard of Joanna Weeb from Copy Hacker. She's kind of the original conversion copywriter. So she was doing a contest on... It was another copywriter site. She was doing a joint uh, contest. And it was... I remember correctly, like had something to do with about pages and had to Mm -hmm. the best, the best comment, the most thoughtful comment one. And so my comment got picked as the best one. And as a prize, she flew me out to Vegas to to see her speak at MicroConf, which is an amazing conference if you've never been. Hold on, it's Um, called MicroCom? Yeah, MicroConf. Okay. Yeah, like conference, micro conference. Okay. So yeah, it's it's focused on like bootstrap self-funded startups and super practical. So if any of your listeners are in that bootstrapped uh, startup type space, best conference for sure that I've ever been to. Anyways, she flew me out there to hear her talk. And while I was there, she asked, I asked her what I should do next. And she said, well, you should probably start your own business and you should probably do it like now before the grass grows under your feet. You forget about this momentum that you've got right now and you just go back to working. So yeah, like I said, I I started the business like two days later. Uh, I didn't put a ton of thought into my name like a lot of people do. I just wanted to get going. And yeah, I started on the side while working at a startup. And then once I couldn't do both anymore and and the side business was paying me more than the the startup salary, I, I quit the job and I've been doing this for about seven years now. That's a cool story. I love 
hearing that. And well, I was telling you that I was building my business on the side for 15 years before I took it full time because I'm a chicken. And I wish I had the balls like that to just be like, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah. It took me a long time. And actually, Andy Crestedino of Orbit Media, he's in Chicago too, like me. And we met up for lunch and he's the one who convinced me to take it full time. So I had my own little mentor experience that pushed me over the edge. Yeah. When, when you have someone that far ahead of you, look at you and say like, now's the time to start it, it. It definitely makes it easier. They probably see something in you or in the work that you've done to date that suggests that you, you will probably have a, a decent go at this. And it sounds like you have uh, just like I have. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it worked out. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> It would have just, uh, you know, wrapped around that story of me being a big freaking chicken if it failed. Yeah, exactly. That's most people's story. So I'm glad you started. <laughs> yeah. So today you're going to be teaching us about the the before, the pre-work and research and strategy that goes into converting prospects to leads to sales. So bring me to the beginning. Tell me how you prepare when you are writing copy for an email sequence that's meant for sales or a sales page. What do you do first? Yeah, so maybe I'll start with what I think a lot of copywriters do because I imagine there'll be some copywriters who are earlier in their careers listening to this and they might recognize this and then I'll show them why that's not the right way to do things. So most copywriters, when they get started, and I was no exception, the client says we need a homepage. The client says we need this onboarding sequence. You jump in, you wordsmith, you write that homepage, write that email sequence, get paid and move on. That's the way a lot of copywriters actually work, especially when they're early in their career and they don't feel like they can speak up. Now, as you progress, what you start to realize is the foundation of good copy is not your ability to come up with interesting or quirky ways of saying things. It's it's rooted in fundamental research. So, you know, who are the competitors? What like what makes up this category? Your ideal prospect, who are they? Who else are, who, who else are they considering at the time? Why are they looking for the solution right now? What was that triggering event? You know, which which criteria are they considering and how do they prioritize that criteria? These are all questions that you actually need answers to if you want to write compelling copy that that moves a needle. And so this is what gets into what we were talking about earlier, where, yeah, we can talk a little bit about copywriting. There's not that much to talk about there. It's going to be more about this this research. And the way that I tend to do this research, I, I roll it out in a, in a few phases. So first phase, and this is how I explain it to clients as well. First phase is reviewing, you know, internal documents, testimonials, market research, sales notes, sales calls, anything that doesn't require me to actually speak to somebody on the team or a customer uh, themselves. And the reason that I do this is that it prepares me for the second phase, which is interviewing staff, especially customer facing staff. And the way I explain this is, By reviewing these internal documents, by the time I speak to your staff, I'm not wasting their time with stupid questions. I have a pretty good idea of what your product does, who your competitors are, you know, who your ideal customer is, and I can start to get into some of the nitty gritty. So when I'm interviewing staff, I'm looking at people in sales, customer support, success, and then to a lesser extent, product, and then marketing a little bit, although I take everything they say with a grain of salt just because they are so close to the product and the problem and the reason they're bringing me in most oftentimes is they want an outside perspective, somebody who's got a little bit of distance. So I don't just take what marketing tells me and and run with it like I might have when I first got started. And what I'm really trying to get at there is I'm trying to understand their product category, the product itself, and their ideal customer as they understand it today from their perspective. And that gives me a baseline. But again, I'm I'm not just taking what they tell me at face value as the absolute truth. It's just a place to start and a place to prepare me for phase three, uh, which is actually starting to interact with customers at this point. So just like you know, reviewing those internal resources prepared me so that I didn't look like an idiot when I spoke to people on their team, speaking to their team prepares me so that I don't look like an idiot when I speak to their customers. <laughs> so and there's an order. 
<laughs> exactly. So everyone's pretty happy about this order because nobody wants to have an outside marketer come in and speak to their customers and, and mess up that relationship. So I go into those customer interviews, or if I'm sending out like a, a jobs to be done style survey, I go into that with a pretty solid understanding of the product category and customer, at least as far as my client understands it. And that's phase three then is that customer interaction. So surveys, interviews. And this is where I start to find one discrepancies between what I was told and what's actually true, which is obviously valuable. That's one of the main reasons people hire me is to find those discrepancies and do something with them. And then the other benefit that comes from this is from the client side, it's I'm actually finding the most painful problems that we can actually solve today versus just doing what they told me to do. So, you know, they might come to me saying, Hey, Josh, we need a homepage. And I'll say, You might need a homepage, but first I need to go through this research, audit, and discovery phase. And if it turns out you need a homepage and that's the most important thing, great. There's a really good chance I'm going to find some other things that you need and that are probably even more important in your homepage. And so the benefit of the client, obviously, like I said, I'm I'm solving the most important problems and I'm, I'm finding problems they didn't even know they had, but were costing them. And then the benefit to somebody like me or to a copywriter who might be listening is that all of a sudden a homepage project, which wouldn't have served the client very well and would have paid you know, X dollars to me, mm-hmm. has turned into a research audit and discovery project, which, which costs money. And I've identified a whole bunch of other deliverables as well that we should work on together. And I'm able to justify it by pointing back to my research. So I've just you know, expanded the project scope for myself, but also, and this is important, expanded the amount of value that my client is going to get from, from working with me. I really like that. So as far as research, deliverables, and order, you have reading the internal docs first. So you're prepared to talk to the customer-facing staff. Then you interview customer-facing staff. And then at last, you start interviewing and surveying customers. And then look for any discrepancies and what their true needs are, what the problems are that that client is solving for those customers. Mm -hmm. So all of this is done through reading and interviews. Do you have any tools that you bring in when you're in this phase? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty basic tools, like obviously interviewing, I'm doing that on Zoom, I'm recording it. If the interview is of a like an especially high quality, I'll pay for a human to actually transcribe that for me, Mm -hmm. which is done at uh, rev.com. If the interview is just kind of so so then I'll usually get that transcribed by a tool like Descript, uh, Descript Descript.com which does like AI transcriptions and they're pretty good, but they'll make some annoying mistakes that you're going to have to go through manually and, and correct I use them for this. <laughs> and I'm like, Abby, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're good. But what annoys me so much, and I don't know if they've fixed this at all is like a company name that isn't like a real word. They will just keep trying different versions of it and get it wrong every single time throughout an entire transcript. I don't know so, if they have fixed yeah, that. <laughs> that. That part is super annoying and, and they make some other silly mistakes. But for a decent transcript, like it's okay. For surveying, I still use uh, Typeform, although I think there's an alternative out there. I cannot remember the name right now that I was thinking of trying next time. Just because the pricing for Typeform is annoying. It's It's monthly. They don't let you do any one-off. Like I need one survey. What's it cost me to run a survey in? For somebody like me who might have a client that I work with for two or three months, I either have to keep paying for Typeform and uh, because I forget to unsubscribe every single time I need to use it or Mm -hmm. yeah, I I usually end up paying for it. And then let's see, what else do I use? I mean, G Suite, pretty basic tools there. I'm using spreadsheets like the data is not organized. Well, it's organized, but it's in spreadsheets. What else do I use? I'm not like a tool heavy person. A lot of this work that I'm doing behind the scenes is just, it's ugly. (laughs) And then if you're, uh, if you're going to uh, present this, which I, which I didn't get to, but if it's like, it's like an optional phase four of a project, which is I've got a lot of insights. I know your customers. I might even know them better than you do. I know your market with this outside perspective, I can either deliver it to you in these spreadsheets or I can put it into a, like a nice presentation that you can use to feed to your sales team, to your content team, marketing, product, support. I would um, honestly and, pay for that. That's yeah, yeah. very worth and, the money. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So for something like that, I would use something like, uh, I think their site is pitch.com for, for Dex. Aside from that, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I have to use for that process. Well, yeah, I'm I think curious. I have one question much, though. Sure. What is the difference between Typeform and like Google Forms? 
type form is honestly just prettier. Okay. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, there might, I haven't used they Google are pretty. Forms in a really long time. Yeah. I, and I haven't used Google Forms in a really long time. So maybe they've, uh, they've caught up and maybe there's feature parity with type form. I just find it really easy to put together a nice form. Like it's nice for me, but mm-hmm. it's also nice for the user. Like it, it looks like something that my client put out, like I can make it their brand colors and include a logo and it looks really nice. So for me, it's really important when I'm working with, you know, a SaaS company that's raised 20 million plus dollars that the survey doesn't look like we couldn't pay 25 bucks a month to, uh, <laughs> to put out a survey. So yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's why I use it. Yeah, I can see that. There isn't too much branding that you could do with Google Forms. It's like a color change. I don't even... Yeah, exactly. Maybe <laughs> fonts, but you can't upload yeah. fonts, so... <laughs> oh, really? No, yeah. No. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. I have a question. And sure. formulas and templates, what are your thoughts on those for copywriting? So are we talking like ADA and PASS and those types of formulas? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're formulas for a reason. It's because a lot of copy, good copy follows them. And so I don't think they should be disregarded. The problem, I think, is when people don't have a good understanding of when and why you're going to use a particular formula. And they just kind of like, I like pass. So everything is going to be, you know, problem agitation solution or I like ADA. And if that's the way you're thinking about it, that's not a good way to think about it. But Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those structures are there for a reason. Most copy does conform to it in one way or another. And they're a good starting place. So, you know, I know that the state of awareness or the stage of awareness for my client's customer is generally like, problem aware, well, that makes me think pass. And I'm probably going to start them off with like a, a problem statement to show them that I understand like where they are right now. And I'm probably going to agitate, agitate that problem. And I'm probably going to finish it off with a solution <laughs> because, because that's naturally what you would do after you made them feel their problem in a visceral way. You should at least help them solve it. Right. So right. Um, yeah, I'm all for it. In terms of templates, I don't work with templates usually. Like I don't, if I'm going to be writing a homepage for a client, I don't have like a homepage template that I just start plugging copy into. In fact, I try to dissuade clients from doing any type of design before they think about copy because you run into this problem where... And now now I refuse to deal with it. But back when I first started, I dealt with it because I needed clients. They would hand me a homepage and there'd be like this section with like, put three points here. And I was like, but based on my research, there's like six I should be putting there. Uh, yeah, but there's place for three. So make it three. <laughs> and so what happens is the design starts to artificially constrain the copy. And so it, it's backwards. So what I always do is I start with the copy and I deliver that in a, like a low-fi wireframe. I guess another tool, Balsamic, uh, when we get into the execution phase of things. it's I deliver copy in a low-fi wireframe. I don't replace a designer or developer. But at least I'm able to start with copy, structure the page around that copy, and hand that off to a capable designer with some guideposts and uh, usually ends up with a better product that way. Yeah, that makes sense. And I follow a ton of copywriters. I'm obsessed with copywriting. It just the, I feel like it's a superpower being able to sell <laughs> through your words. <laughs> so yeah, I follow yeah. a lot of copywriters. And that's one thing that they talk about all the time is that you can't have that template or the design first. You need to have the copy first. You do. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes like reality strikes and you have to you can't wait for all the copy to be done before any design work gets done because they're you know preparing for a conference and that they need to launch this new site for if mm-hmm. that's the case you can get into things like uh, brand color you can do some styling around like elements on a page that you know you're going to have like testimonials or product screenshots you just can't put together like like a concrete template that the copywriter has to plug copy into unless you want to just kind of cut your legs off and, and ruin the whole project yeah that makes sense So what do you think the key is to writing compelling copy that actually converts? So, I mean, I think I've answered some of this and that it's definitely, it's definitely everything that comes before the words. The words part is actually not that hard once you've done that work. In fact, I always know that I haven't done enough research when the word part is really hard, when I'm not sure what to say and how to say it. It means I haven't done enough research yet. And, and I'm trying to get creative like Mad Men style, which is not the way, <laughs> that's not the way good copy is actually written. So it's definitely a foundation in that. And then more recently, and this is where we get into this um, category story that I've been talking about lately. Mm-hmm. It's in my space anyways, in SaaS, where it's increasingly crowded. All product categories for the most part are quite crowded with solutions that are 
quite similar, serving similar customers. They are communicating their similar product to their similar customers in a very similar way because they're all going through that same process that I was just telling you about, which is interview your customers, use their words, and then make that your copy. That used to be a differentiator back when I got started in 2016. If you were interviewing customers and incorporating what they say and how they say it into your copy, that made you different and you stood out, your message was more compelling. Now, this is fairly common practice. And so this results in a bunch of companies sounding the same. So I still think you need to do this, but you can't just go from that research phase to putting the voice of customer onto the page and expect to seem different or better than your competitors. I think you need to also spend quite a bit of time taking a look at your competitors, especially like the incumbent in a space, a category leader, and look for gaps in their messaging and their positioning and ideally their product and address those. So for example, for some concrete examples, because that probably seems a little bit abstract, if you're competing in the email marketing space, you'd want to have a really good idea of what MailChimp does, how they communicate what they do, and who they do it for. And you would want your product and messaging and positioning to be a reaction to that if you wanted to be successful, which is ConvertKit, for example. If you've heard of ConvertKit, if you're a creator or a blogger and you need email marketing, ConvertKit has done a really good job of differentiating themselves from the incumbent, MailChimp, and attracting clients or customers, I should say, that are you know creators and bloggers specifically and repelling everyone else. In the analytics space, you have Fathom Analytics, simple, like simple dashboards compared to Google Analytics with a focus on security and privacy. These are things that are the opposite of the incumbent, Google Analytics. And so their messaging is not... I should say the quality of their messaging is not just down to the words they choose or the voice of the customer. It's making sure that they zoom in and really emphasize these key differences from the incumbent. So I guess to summarize, it would be do that research, that voice customer research, but don't stop there. Now take a look at the category, the people you're competing against and look for opportunities to differentiate there. Does that make sense? You might need to ask some probing questions because that's a, it's a massive topic. <laughs> no, that makes a ton of sense to me. It, it's taking what you already gave us, that foundation, one step further, adding in that competitive analysis, and then really taking a look and seeing what your unique value proposition can be, knowing that this is what theirs is. Exactly. And, it, and I think it's just a natural progression. Like I've been... Um, and a lot of people seem to agree with this, SaaS is just following the progression that all types of product categories follow over time. So for example, I think SaaS, and this might be controversial to some, but I think SaaS is moving towards commodities like toilet paper, toothpaste, makeup, and away from things like rocket ships and like vaccines. Like I've been reading that a lot on LinkedIn lately. Like Casper, for example, the mattress company is considering themselves a SaaS. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is an example. But what I'm what I'm trying to say here is that SaaS is increasingly commoditized. It's not enough to just say like, you have a problem, here's the solution. That's what a rocket ship is. Like, you want to go to space, here's a rocket mm-hmm. ship. You don't need to hire me to sell that rocket ship. If you built it, and it can go to space, like it's going to sell if, if, if someone wants to go to space. But right. with SaaS, it's not enough because... I need email marketing, you, you do email marketing, but so do these like 500 other people. Why should I choose you? And that's kind of what you run into with toilet paper, toothpaste, makeup. Yeah, we're all doing something saying. very similar, right? Mm-hmm. And so we're, we need to start applying some of those types of marketing strategies and that, that way of thinking about marketing and sales that are using like, you know, consumer packaged goods to SaaS. We're not there yet, but that's the way we're moving. We're moving that way and, and away from rocket ships. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. There's not just one solution anymore. There yeah. isn't. No, it's, it's very them. rare. I think in my seven years, I've worked with maybe one client who was doing something truly proprietary that would not easily be copied. And it was because it was like, he was like an MIT PhD in artificial intelligence, and he was making software based on that. So that was not going to be copied, but everybody else, it can can be copied. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I'm glad you brought up AI. We need to wrap up soon because I like TED Talk rules, try and keep it at that time limit that people can pay attention. But Mm -hmm. um, what is your thought on like the big surge of AI companies in copywriting? How do 
copywriters and AI merge together because I don't think AI can stand alone without without you. Yeah. So, so far, well, I, sh- I should disclose, I've actually worked with a company in uh, copywriting at AI. So copy.ai, I mm-hmm. did work for them in the past. So that should tell you something. That should tell you that, you know, they're not okay. just hiring their tool to write all their copy is, is what it is. But what's different is copy AI is actually honest and that they are on your side and that they don't think these copywriting tools are necessarily meant to replace like top quality copywriters. They see it more as a way to, you know, super low value tasks, use something like copy. AI and just let them hammer it out. But really what, what they see is AI as a tool that's going to work alongside a professional. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've played with it in the past where, you know, I'm stuck on an idea. I want to get some different angles. I'll put some information into copy AI. It'll spit out some ideas. I never take them verbatim. Like it's not just copy paste. I, I throw it into my client's document or anything like that, but it, it at least gives me a starting place and something to build on. So that and and I think this gets into a much larger conversation, which is is AI replacing humans or is AI going yeah, to like <laughs> augment humans, help us do our do better work and and do work that we enjoy more. And at least in the short term, I think that's where the big opportunity is. It's in making humans better. Long term, you know, you know, who knows? We'll probably all be enslaved to robots, but <laughs> I, I think that's still a little ways away. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I completely agree with you. Where there's a lot of, you know, nerves, stress around the introduction of AI copywriters. And I really think it's just a support of copywriting, helping you get a little bit better, get a little bit faster, but you can't do it without a brain behind it. You can't do it without strategy, without the research. And exactly. what is spit out in the end, it's not perfection. It, it needs a human with the talent. Yeah, exactly. And, and I always say, like, I'm not I'm not going to say that AI can never replace copywriters. I think that would be naive. But once we get to a point where AI is truly replacing, like, specialized top end copywriters, it's replacing a lot of other things first. So mm-hmm. I think we will see it coming. It's a, it's a fairly complex task that we're asking to replace. And so if it's if it's done that, the world has already changed. And we've probably already seen this coming and hopefully adapted <laughs> before <Yeah>. we're obsolete. <laughs> right? So yes. That's the way I see it. You. So what, how a, what can, a bleak way to end this. <laughs> I know, right? I should have started with that in the beginning. <laughs> uh, I know. But uh, yeah, um, were you going to ask where you can find me? Yes. Yes, I was. Yeah. yeah. Are so, you AI? Uh, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. But uh, yeah, so on Twitter is probably where I'm most active in terms of social, at Sway Copy. In terms of copywriting work, swaycopy.com. And if this idea of telling a category story, a story that's bigger than your product story, but actually encompasses all the players in your space, I talk about this at CategoryStory.com. It's a free currently monthly newsletter. I might up that uh, frequency a little bit more down the road, but right now it's free and monthly and uh, yeah, people are loving it so far. Yes. Please come back and we could talk all about Category Story because I'm really curious about that. For sure. Yeah. so much. Thank you. All right. I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for sitting here with me and listening to my interview with Josh. I learned a ton from him and I think that you will too. So here are your next steps. This is how you take action. Number one, before you write a word, make sure to read all of the documentation about the product service company that you're writing for. Number two, Meet with the team. Try and understand exactly what they think of the product service company. And don't just talk to marketing. Talk to sales. Talk to operations. Talk to the C-suite. Talk to everybody that you can. And then last, talk to customers and get an idea of how that company solves problems for them. That is the real key to understanding how to write great copy that converts. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. And I just want to remind you that if you want to be in the loop and know when new content is being produced, sign up for my nucle- my weekly newsletter. It's where it's at. <laughs> so every Tuesday, you'll find out if we have new podcasts, new live streams, new blogs, 
all sorts of stuff every single Tuesday. So go to sarahnoelblock.com slash newsletter. It's also in the show notes to sign up for that. And I will see you guys soon. Thank you for joining Tiny Marketing. I help tiny marketing departments create consistent content that builds trust with your audience. Get one month of content in one week by visiting sarahnoelblock.com. And take what you learned today and apply it to your tiny marketing department to see the growth that you deserve. Don't forget to follow the podcast on your favorite podcast app. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button. We'll see you next time.